Great, which I've got, I decided to be a little briefer <laughs> this time than last time. So I've only got three things, which the first one is a list of things, but um, which is the mayor put out the legislative priorities. I think some of us are gonna send a list of other priorities that we don't think were in the letter. One of them is Green Mountain Transit and funding public transportation generally. Do talk to your legislatures, but I don't actually think that our legislatures are the ones that are going to not prioritize. So I would say also write letters to some of the other folks across the state. Um, and then I think the other things that I think are still priorities for our legislatures, especially since some of them are online, um, is the housing for all. So what Julia spoke to, we have a lot of pending charter changes that were approved by the voters that the legislature still hasn't approved. That's everything from gun regulations to just cause that um, I'd really like the legislature can take that up without us passing again. So I hope that they do that. Um, citizen oversight, the oversight authority generally, um, the city's ability to regulate cannabis, um, which we don't really have right now. Um, so those are to me some of the priorities that I think weren't in the mayor's letter that I will be reaching out to legislators for. The second thing um, is already mentioned by uh, Sharon at Speak Out is Trinity Campus. Um, I there's a I post I sent a letter to Carolyn Tom, so I think they'll post kind of the full update, so you can go to the NPA website after this meeting if not already to um, read kind of the full update. But I just for folks who don't, there were five city councilors, myself, Joe McGee, Jack Hansen, Ben Travers, and Sarah Carpenter, who sent a letter to the Planning Commission last summer asking them to um, consider the impact that UVM has. So I think the plan to build more housing on Trinity, I don't think is a bad plan. I'm not worried about the height. I'm not worried about the setback, but I am worried about um, the fact that they have stopped their MOU with the city and what that means for holding having any accountability for how we house students, especially the fact that juniors and seniors not just aren't living, aren't, um, don't need to live on campus, but even aren't allowed to live on campus because they don't have enough housing. I just think the university needs to be a much, much better and much more proactive partner with the city than they've been in a really long time. And instead it feels like they're pulling back um, which is the wrong, I feel like, move. And this is the first first time we've had any ability to have any accountability with them since I've joined the council, and I think even since long before that. So I just really hope um, that uh, <laughs> my fellow counselors will um, not approve the Trinity campus, not because I don't want to see Trinity campus built, but I think they need to come to the table to have a real negotiation before. I think we move forward with anything. So I'll be working with other counselors, um, specifically making sure that we've got bipartisan support for um, make, holding UVM accountable before we sign that. The Planning Commission did pass it for one. Our lone ward one rep, um, Alexander Friend, um, was the no vote. But even in passing it, the Planning Commission said that they saw a lot of concerns and that they figured we wouldn't approve it until there were some um, transparency and accountability issues addressed around student body size. So I think that this is a real issue. Um, and I, yeah, I encourage all of you to reach out, um, especially, I think I've got the progressives on like, so especially to our, um, my Democratic colleague. Yeah, absolutely. Louder. They're saying you need to okay. uh, city. And I, you know, I haven't been in, as involved until recently. So I feel as though we were able to have a great conversation and I was able to bring up a lot of concerns uh, from Ward 1 residents in particular that I've heard. Um, and, and about how Trinity really needs to be this mutually uh, agreed upon. I believe the MOU is absolutely imperative, um, but to really work together to create solutions for the entire city and all of its residents, whether they are students or families or um, 
homeowners. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, so I do feel that. Uh, yeah. Oh, I do feel that um, things are going to get better. And I think that communication, the lines of communication are open. He's the, I think he's like the community engagement coordinator for you. I'm not a hundred, but it's that's the yeah, but he's higher up positive yeah. and um, really spoke to the people that would be yeah, yeah. So, 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 so Joe, Joe. Joe Spidell, S-P-I-E, yeah, um, and so the MOU is a kind of historic agreement, which I think Earhart actually worked on the first iteration of the MOU, maybe back when he was a city councilor, um, and it's an agreement, I don't remember everything that's in it, um, it definitely speaks to how UVM will be transparent about their um, housing, how it, I think, I don't know if it says it in the MOU or if that's somewhere else that um, they will provide a new bed for every new undergraduate that comes. It has some commitments around housing, also around is the, yeah, and admissions. Um, maybe is the payment in lieu in there as well? The payment in lieu was in the MOU, so they're voluntary taxes. Um, I will say I've spoken with Joe Spidell, Wendy Koenig, Richard Case, which are all folks who work at UVM. I think Joe and Wendy are great, um, but at the same time, like, I don't think Richard's great, but that's different. Um, I, I do like, um, like from what I've heard them say to me is that the president is not interested and they don't see a path forward with him signing another MOU, which I'm like, that is to me the baseline commitment. They were very negative about the chances of that happening again. When I left, I'm speaking to Wendy again next week, so that could have changed, but and every conversation I've had with them, they're like, that's a non-starter, which I don't understand how that, how we're going to move forward if that's, if an if a written agreement isn't on the table anymore. So I'm not as positive um, based on the conversations I've had with them. But again, maybe things have changed. Um, there was one more update. Oh, um, housing, houselessness. Um, the CDNR committee started a kind of theoretical conversation on camping in parks, which got a lot of pushback, especially from people living in parks. I think folks were really worried that we would take some of the like parks parks that we have. So we're thinking like Letty's, Smalley, um, and things like that. So we're trying to, and now there's a lot of urgency. I think there's starting to be a lot of, we've had the theoretical debate. Um, and I think now there's a lot of urgency with the housing vouchers ending in, end of April, so I think May 1st, we won't have any of the housing vouchers. Our houseless population has increased a lot during the pandemic. People are struggling, more folks are entering into houselessness, um, more folks are staying in houselessness because they're not getting out of it again. So we're gonna have a, a large number of people, um, way more than we had before the pandemic, pandemic who are gonna be houseless. Um, starting May 1st, and um, right now it's a huge, it takes so much energy for staff to move the different campsites, it's, it's dangerous, it's, uh, nobody likes it, everybody's frustrated by it, when you move a campsite you have to tell people to leave, but you can't tell them anywhere to go because all the other shelters, beds are full, um, so it's already been a huge stressor, it's only going to come first. So we're going to try to move quickly on at least arranging a few allowed campsites in various urban areas around Burlington. I don't know what that's going to look like yet. We've had some conversations with city staff on what that would look like and where those campsites would be, where we can at least provide porta potties and have some knowledge of where folks are so that we can try to get them services. That's a horrible solution to houselessness, but um, it's, I think the least that we can do is when we tell people that they can't be there, at least try to give them somewhere else to go. Can That's, you give us an example of where that might be? Yeah, so right now there's probably 40 campsites around Burlington that are 
How many? 40 something. 40. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and so there's, I don't actually know, but we talked to some of the park rangers and I think they've got about eight locations in mind of where they would want to concentrate folks and have five, four to six people um, camping there at a time. I don't know where those locations are, but I assume they're supposed to be a certain ways off of paths, a certain way from like our more traditional parks like Letty and things like that. Um, and I don't know specifically the locations. I assume they wouldn't be advertised either for general folks. Yes. Are you saying that there are 40 people camping or 40 sites with 10, Site, 20, whatever? Sites, not all of them are always, don't always have someone there. Okay. And sense. how are they going to put that many people into eight? sites that they're looking at. I don't and not seems absurd. I don't know and not everybody's I'm gonna use sites. and not everybody's gonna use the campsites that are provided by the city either. And oh, okay. yeah. And then of course we've got Elmwood opening up this How month we hope that? it's 30 something yeah years. not many but it is supposedly one of the, not supposedly, I've, <laughs> we've been told one of the most cost-effective ways we found to house people um, and even then also providing them much higher services than they've gotten in some of the other places like the motels. So hopefully that'll be a model that we can scale on. I got just a, a comment and that's, um, I'm gonna keep it here. I guess I think they can. Don't leave me. I'm pretty sure we're at the point where you can speak from anywhere because we're off of this shotgun mic. So, oh, just, okay. Just be loud. Um, I had a friend call me and said that there were uh, people uh, sleeping in cars overnight on the street. Is that a common occurrence now? I think it's becoming a more common occurrence. I assume once the motel voucher ends, it'll be a more common occurrence. And I think that's one of the things that folks were talking about as well. I mean, that was the one time, the first time that I didn't have housing, I slept in my cars. I think it's a common kind of in-between um, situation to be in. So I think we're also happy, hoping to have a designated site that's car camping, essentially. Okay. But again, I don't know if any of this will happen. We're still in early figuring out what that would look like. And um, if you know folks who are like, we're gonna need a community partner. The city can't be the one providing all the services. We're gonna need some of the other nonprofits we have in Burlington to step up and be a partner in that. <laughs> Earhart, thanks, Tom. Um, thanks. I don't know if this is right. Can folks hear from back here? Awesome, thank you. Um, thanks for all the work you're doing on um, the um, camping campsites. Um, just one quick correction. Uh, so the uh, state's motel voucher program uh, is actually not that long ago, was, uh, has been extended at a 50% level for uh, folks uh, until the end of the state's fiscal year. So June, June 30th, uh, they're providing a bit more of a bridge that goes beyond uh, March uh, in order uh, basically to give people um, a bridge. And that's at 50% of, of cost. So right now it's at 70% until March uh, for the lowest income folks. So it's a little bit, you know, a little bit better than what had originally been announced. Um, and then uh, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity just announced uh, today that uh, they have a hundred uh, kind of bridge vouchers uh, for folks living in motels um, and in, uh, in shelters uh, to um, get housing. Of course, the problem is that there isn't a whole lot of housing to begin with, even if you have a voucher, but at least uh, this way, um, folks who are, and this is for families, uh, families with children, uh, pregnant moms, um, uh, there's a lot of information on CBOEO's website for folks who want to look into this. Uh, at least it's 100 vouchers um, and will help uh, 100 households uh, to hopefully bridge to a more permanent Section 8 voucher. The only other thing I, I just want to say, May, I, I appreciate that you had a, a great conversation with Joe. Um, it's great sometimes to bring fresh, fresh uh, eyes and ears and voices to this discussion. I'll just say from my perspective, you know, things have been a lot better with the university than they were when I was there back in the late 80s. Um, they have been a lot better 
and it's you know it's it's gone up and down. Uh, it's been cyclical. Um, the fact that they are not willing to entertain an MOU with the city to me is a really bad sign. Um, and I would urge city councilors to hold the university's feet to the fire um, because you know ultimately um, to get what is needed for the community. I think UVM needs to come to the table in an official way and uh, needs to um, make some some commitments and move and do it in in in, in a, a written accountable way, which is through an MOU. And I would urge you guys to not act on um, the Trinity uh, rezoning unless and until you get some kind of promises from them about freezing. Um, or you know, maintaining their their student uh, body levels um, at, at at certain reasonable levels that you know help help the community. As a historical note, I think I've mentioned this before. The first uh, MOU that we had with the city, um, we only received it because we held up a zoning permit for a building that they wanted to build, um, and that's what got UVM to the table the first time around. Not suggesting you want to be that extreme now. I'm just giving you a historical <laughs> note. Um, that's how they got their first commitments to student housing. That's how we got their commitment um, to require that sophomores live on campus, which it used to just be freshmen. And as of that first MOU, it was also a sophomore. Um, they replaced uh, the housing that they demolished at uh, University Heights. It was 100 units of housing uh, for um, retired staff and for graduate students. That became Centennial Court. Um, it also preserved the core area of Centennial Woods, uh, which had never been, um, there, there was no absolute legal, legally binding mechanisms to make sure that Centennial Woods was not developed. Um, so those are some of the hallmarks of something we did, you know, back in the late 80s, early, early 90s, and it took a lot to get there. Thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, I, I thought I like saw that. a hand up. Totally. Troy, did you have your hand up? Yeah, um, Erhard, correct me. This might not be accurate, and I can connect with Representative Small from Winooski because I think she's got a lot of information on it. But I think with the new uh, hotel plans, it was temperature dependent, meaning if, if we raise above the temperature, those hotels are no longer available. That, that, that is correct. So, um, through COVID, um, the state got a lot of federal dollars. Those are the ones to, to essentially uh, create a motel voucher program for, for all um, so that people could shelter safely. Uh, congregate shelters were not safe uh, for distancing. Uh, many of them shut down. Many of them went to 50% of uh, capacity. And so at the height of that program, we had approximately 2,700 people living in motels uh, coming from homelessness, um, living in motels around the state. That program is ending. There is an underlying program called the General Assistance Emergency Housing Program that continues to be funded. It was also federally funded during the pandemic. Um, and that has uh, something called adverse weather conditions associated with it. So through EAGA, which is the acronym, um, that will continue. Um, and those adverse weather conditions basically are um, they're in, in as my understanding is that they're in, in force and effect, not on a day to day basis, but more or less um, from now through to March. So thank, thank you for that, Troy. Zariah, may I? Yeah, and while we're talking about yeah. shelter during the Monday city council meeting, uh, we heard from Brian Pine from CETO about the Elmwood Avenue shelter project. And apparently a bathhouse has arrived. Uh, and once that is connected, then uh, it will be open for, you know, the shelters will be open for habitation. Uh, and it's it's been delayed, um, but they're trying really hard to get that up and running. Um, Anything else? Unless there's question. <laughs> Okay, well, you're going to talk a lot more. <laughs> no. yeah. With back to the Trinity thing, uh, I think that what Earhart said is so important, and it can't be like just a promise. It has to be in writing, mm -hmm. and it really is the only way to. And I remember at the last meeting we talked about if they're building 400 beds, 200 need to be for juniors and seniors, and 200 for freshmen. 
it can't be only freshmen because in two years those freshmen are gonna those freshmen will then be juniors in our neighborhoods and that's what it's all about trying to preserve housing for everybody not just UVM students yeah and I mean even just a step in like allowing juniors and seniors to live on campus would be uh, they're allowed they're, they're allowed. just they're, they're allowed but different. there's no housing for them but like the residency director of Trinity campus was like as far as I know they're not. Sure. Okay, so, um, <laughs> when they came through um, and and talked about their survey, what they said was that, and this has not changed because when we did the site visit for Trinity, juniors and seniors don't want to live on campus. There are a percentage that wouldn't mind doing it, but affordability is one issue and restrictions are another. So even though we're talking like we are in the driver's seat and I, I, don't get me wrong, I totally support um, getting an MOU, but we can't mandate that juniors and seniors live on campus, live in that housing. We can, we could go and see if there was any appetite, which I'm sure there wouldn't be to require juniors to live on campus. It took a long time to go from freshman to sophomore. But I really do believe that um, we cannot force juniors and seniors to live in that housing. And so that's a fallacy that we have. We want that to happen, but we can't mandate that. Um, okay. but it, didn't Todd Sloshberg, who's a lawyer, didn't he bring that up at the last meeting about it? It seems like there is, oh, you know, it can be housing, designated housing. And, you know, again, I thought that's what you said at our last MPA. And but they don't have people that want to live there. That's the point. Um, that's the real issue. That's so I just want to add that in addition to having students, UVM is a huge employer. Exactly. And they could be. They could, yeah. And also a huge landowner. <laughs> UVM owns huge tracts of land throughout South Burlington. So I think focusing just on the student housing is slightly, I mean, I understand because it also has the adverse impact on the neighborhoods, right? But but we can enlarge our view a bit to look at the whole impact of UVM on the housing market, and that might get us further. So just one more, uh, this is actually good news. Um, okay, one more piece on, on the student housing. Um, uh, in my um, work capacity, I actually have the honor of going to a groundbreaking um, for UVM Medical Center, which is developing a hundred, uh, a total of 160 uh, housing units in South Burlington, in the city center uh, for their uh, nurses, for their, their employees, because they are similarly impacted by the housing uh, shortage. And at that, uh, I heard that uh, the university is uh, about to, um, Will probably be an announcement at some point, but uh, over the next several years, they're planning on building approximately 400 units of housing uh, for for university staff. Uh, also at City Center, it will be a phased development. Um, it, I think it's supposed to start in uh, March, if I'm remembering the date right. Uh, but just another encouraging piece on both the housing front and uh, the, you know the problems with workforce. Um, having uh difficulties finding finding housing and, and just the, the whole housing mess crisis and my understanding too is that that's to include child care uh or that that's correct yeah uh, that's the medical center housing we're we'll include we're gonna have a job we're gonna have to move forward but um exactly. i think see so counselors you realize that we're a lot of people have opinions about this so <laughs> i'm just gonna leave with that thank you for coming and, and uh, participating and we're gonna move on to the school commissioner's update. I'm like, it's, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I did not see more waste than it's budget time. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> so um, the budget, it looks like there will be cuts this year. Total of, of 10 reductions, 3.2 FTEs will be added. And so a net reduction of 6.8 FTEs. Some of that has to do with lower student numbers in the different schools. And the hope is that through 
attrition that we won't have to let anyone go. We won't have to give out pink slips because I guess there's enough people they either know are leaving or are retiring that we can do this without some huge loss of jobs here. So that's the biggest thing in this. I mean, there the, certainly I can tell you where the reductions are being looked at. If people are interested in that, it'd just take a long time. And I'm not sure that they, I, yeah. Can I ask okay. a quick question? Yes. What is the reduction in students? You said there were fewer students. There are in, in schools across. So where those, where in whatever schools there are less kids in, they are. I was wondering how, how many fewer kids there go. No, I knew you'd ask me that. And it never, that, they never told us exactly. I don't know. Okay. It, it is in here somewhere, I think. That's okay. It, That's okay. Like That's okay. A hundred, maybe a hundred and. And maybe it's not even that much, but across the, it's less than 100, but it, it is across the district. Over the last couple of years, we've lost close to 100. If you, I think I remember from the, because we got the presentation on Monday. So the high school and middle school populations essentially haven't changed. Right. Um, well, so, the high school has a little bit. Only yeah, only a little, but not compared to 2019. I think it's almost the same. And yeah. then the K through five, I feel like it was like quite maybe even like a couple. It's like I don't remember the numbers, but I do remember the line. It seems like a kind of drastic, and they sounded like they didn't 100 percent know if it was just like school choice only seemed to factor for a small number of that. They didn't quite know how K through five could be decreasing that much for middle school and high school was staying. <laughs> But the other thing is, the one good thing is, is as those numbers went down in the grade school, uh, Superintendent Flanagan had the bright idea why we have this huge waiting list of kids trying to get into pre-K. So he took and added pre-Ks into those classrooms at the different schools so that we have no one waiting on the waiting list for pre-K anymore. So, sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the school buildings are full, but you know, it's not all with K through 12. So that's about it, unless someone has questions. Do we have sure. questions from people online? I don't see any hands up. Can I ask one question? Sure. Which is just, we have quite a few folks come to the, I don't know if you've heard about the drama at yes. the IAA. Do you have an opinion on that? Do they value your opinion? I. I I, I mean, is, I the drama teacher is getting cut at IAA, but it was a contract right. position, and so they think it's fine. Well, I just heard the last last night at a committee meeting I was at, where where people from IAA came, teachers, and I didn't realize that that position actually has been going since the school existed. It was in the beginning funded through the through uh, Flynn Theater, and then they had to go out and get grants to keep it going. So it has been going there for a long time, and that wasn't what I thought I heard in the presentation. So it is something that a lot of us are going to ask about. Uh, the other thing that I worry about is more of the coaches that are being added and personally and that's I have watched this go on and we have had coaches since 2005 and no one can give us the data that says that they're they're worthwhile I mean we have the have teachers yeah. yeah and so what are they doing? Because in that time, we have seen some of our math and what do you call it scores go down, the literacy Great. scores go way down. And so I, so for me, that's, and it would be the one thing I've never voted against the budget, but I, until they can start showing this data, I don't, I don't want to say yes. And so it's the biggest thing, although there's plenty of other things in this budget that I, 
I think are great, but it's like, please finally give us the data that proves that we should be spending well over a million dollars for all these coaches. Especially because they're substituting in some instances teachers for coaches. Yes. Yeah. Karen. Um, so speaking to what Dariah mentioned about the people that came and spoke about the drama position, that seemed to be integral to that school. It's sort of consistent with the mission of that right. school. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's very different than not that I don't value all the, oh, no. the art programs, et cetera, but it seemed to be uh, uh, something, an outlier that really stood out once at once people brought it to everyone's attention. It seemed inconsistent with, with an action that the, the school would take. And I understand that they said there might be other sources of funding, but uh, I was very concerned about that as just a member of the public, not even didn't mm -hmm. send my kids to that school. That that whole system wasn't in place then. But as a continuing member of this community, I would like I would hope that the school board would try to find a way to solve that problem. Thank you. Well, the school I have to say has done a good job of coming out and letting us all know. Okay. So thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have. Um, Jeff Padgett, he's going to talk about uh, parking services, and you've got a presentation. Yes, let's see if I can get this going. There you go. Let's see. Going. All right, so I've got about eight slides I'd like to go through. Um, it, I recognize we're running about 10 minutes late, so I got a lot of content. We've made a lot, a lot of changes in parking. I know parking can be a very passionate thing, and we're working really hard towards fixing a lot of the aesthetic okay. problems. So I've got a lot in here. I'm going to blow through as fast as I can. I want to give some time for questions. I know people have questions. So I apologize for the speed, but uh, here we go. So my name is Jeff Padgett. I'm the division director for parking and traffic. One of the parts of what I do is parking services. So this is how we're organized. So let me get rid of this. Go away. Does this go anyway? <laughs> you mean the uh, the panel? Yes. I've yeah. Got yeah like all the yeah. Um, all right. So part, we're going to have parking services tonight. But that's one of three things I do. I also run the parking facilities, which is the garages and the lots. And I run the traffic group, which is all of the meters, all the signs, the lines, the signals, the crosswalks, the crossing guards. And my message on this slide is that these are three independent groups. Parking services is a general fund. Special revenue is a completely insulated, non-tax exposed fund. And traffic is a totally insulated traffic, uh, insulated, non-tax exposed fund. Parking services is a contributor to the general fund. So we basically, all my group operates without a single tax dollar. And we actually contribute to the general fund. So every quarter that goes in a meter downtown pays for the signals that are coming, which a lot of people don't understand. So that's the point of this slide, is just so you understand the architecture of how my group runs. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is parking services. So when I came in, I decided we needed to re-understand how parking tickets work. And we realized that every parking ticket that gets issued is fundamentally around safety or equity. We've, as a community, written an ordinance or a law that says you can't park to your corner because it's not safe. You can't park in front of a hydrant because it's not safe. You can't block your neighbor's driveway because it's not safe. You can't park in a handicap spot because it's not equitable. If you overstay a meter, you're actually denying the opportunity for the next person to come and use a meter. That's an equity issue. So we've actually methodically gone through every single uh, ordinance and ticket that we issue and assign, whether it's a safety equity concept, and started to change how we're working on right now, changing some of our ordinances to make them a little more fair because we realize some of them are a little bit severe. Um, so safety and equity is something my team gets sick of hearing me talk about. Uh, <laughs> the goal is to minimize tickets. 
and minimize telling because we recognize that tickets suck. That little green envelope, you get it on your car, it just makes you mad. Even if it's just $15, $15 is a lot of money for a lot of people. And we certainly don't want to tow somebody's car. That's their asset. They own it. That's how they get to their job. It's a part of their life. It doesn't need to be out in Splane's yard in Wilkes, uh, South Brampton. Splane's, by the way, is a very good partner of ours. We work really well with them. So that's our overall goal. So some of the structural changes that we've made over the past three years. In 2020, uh, working with the mayor, we um, there was an initiative to move parking enforcement out of the police and move them into park into DPW. And in that end, and that's actually why I, I have this job. I took this job specifically to initiate that change. And uh, and in the process, we didn't just move them; we rebranded them. They're not parking enforcement; they're parking services. They're not parking enforcement officers; they're parking service agents. So we're working towards uh, a sort of a slightly different stylistic approach. Um, we also concurrently, we took the gates off the garages, which was fairly controversial, but now the garages run just like the streets. You have park mobile, or you can pay at a kiosk, it's exactly the way it works on the street. Um, and in the process, that opened up staff because the staff that was working in the garage now didn't have a job. So per se, we actually eliminated that job, but we created a new job for them in parking services. So we've tripled our workforce um, in parking services. <clears throat> um, really focused on customer service. Um, we've reimagined a, a couple of different manager positions to focus on creating a one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. So the same person is now in charge of issue of uh, uh, selling permits and also enforcing the park. So it's like. They're selling a product and then they're sort of quote unquote a little p policing the product that they sell. Um, we created positions across the board, union level positions that are uh, uh, senior level union positions to create a, more of a management structure for the union level workers, along with creating more uh, actual management management positions, all of different management positions. And what this has all resulted in is we have in increased coverage and better services. You get a little green envelope on your car, you're going to say, uh, yeah, right. But that's what we're doing. I'm working on it every day. And it's 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 a slow, it's a slow slide. So some of the things we've done, is I've got the one-stop shop. If you've got any questions about parking, come down to 645 Pine Street, come to the window, you'll get an answer. Call 540-2380, you'll get an answer. We're actually absorbing BPRWs, so parks, because they're very good at parks, but not as good at parking. So we're absorbing their lots and we're gonna actually start managing their products. And I'm going to public work commission next week to get authority to actually enforce their lots. So we're expanding our scope of what we do. So we can become that true one-stop shop. Um, we reformed SCOF uh, two years ago. If you got a ticket for a snow ban, you didn't pay it. And then you got another ticket, car was towed. So it was basically one and done. And that just wasn't fair. So we raised stuff to $275. So you can get multiple tickets. And then we expressly stated in ordinance that we cannot, as a city, hunt for stuff. You have to be in stock if you're over that threshold and get another ticket. But then you're, and then you are exposed to get towed. So I think we made it much more fair across the board. Fines for food. We just got done with fines for food. I don't know if everybody's heard of this, but if you have overdue tickets at holiday time, you pay off your overdue tickets, we give half the money to eating chicken. We just raised nearly $80,000. So we're gonna cut them a check for 40 grand. We did the same last year, we cut them a check for $40,000. So these are the sort of transformations I think. And this is why I'm here tonight, is to sort of expose some of these things that are fly under the radar, but we're working on every day. Um, two hours free parking, we gave out all city parking assets on Fridays and Saturdays during the holiday season, two hours free. And we actually see, we have not analytics, but there's an impact. Um, we provide discount parking to BHS to support their downtown high school. We support them, support them in a rooftop garden that they're uh, looking to install on top of the downtown garage. Um, we're working with car shares for electrification of their car share spots that exist in our garages for free. Um, and we talked about Elmwood. We actually were integral in supporting the transformation of the Elmwood parking lot because that was mine. 
uh, work with Samantha Sheen on it was it was really cool. Uh, so other thing we've done is we are going to a fully digital platform. Um, we have resident only parking permits that are digital now. So if you've got one of those green stickers on your car and you don't like it, make sure you stop down at 645 Pine Street, check in and make sure you are make sure you're current. And then you can also make sure that your plates are registered in the system and that sticker can come off. Um, <laughs> and then contractor parking, one of the big complaints I've had multiple hour long phone calls with contractors. <laughs> fuming because they got a parking ticket on their truck and their trailer. <laughs> so we created a program where they can actually buy a, I think it's weekly, monthly, or annual permit that allows them to park in resident only parking while they're doing work. So the kids park there all the time, but while they're doing work. Uh, we created the whoops program, which has replaced and expanded the blue chips. I don't know if you guys know about the blue chips that are collecting in your drawers. Yeah. Well, those are basically get out of jail free card, right? So what we did is we expanded that program to reach out to all parking in the city that's not safety, uh, uh, parking related infractions that are not safety related. So if you overstay a meter once a year, you can say, whoops, I just didn't pay the meter and get out of it. If you park in resident only, and you didn't ask your who you were visiting to give you a guest permit, you got a ticket, you say, whoops, I, I got, and then you get out of the ticket. Um, so in some ways it feels narrower because you don't have those four blue chips in your drawer anymore. But on the other hand, if you've got 12 friends and they all screw up, well, the first four under the blue chip system, the first four get out of it, and the last eight went off to pay the tickets. This way it's a little more equitable and puts the responsibility on the guest to actually recognize that they're parking in a special neighborhood and check in with their host to make sure they're playing by the rules. Um, and in the process of this, we're also creating an online portal that's very close to rolling out that will allow you to park your guests digitally. So you can actually log into your account and add your card. Yeah, that's awesome. Is there a place where you can find out more about the Blue Chip program? The I mean, Whoops program? Hmm? The Whoops? The whoops, yeah, because I mean, I heard what you said, but I need to think about it and I'd like to be able to refer to it. So, is there a place that it's in ordinance? It, but for a resident, is there a like a little cheat sheet? Well, <laughs> funny you should, so this is so one of the things, yes, so yes, <laughs> yes, and, yes, and no. So, we recognize that we've had a hard time getting the word out to this, okay. but part of what we're doing, we, we have a whole new back end platform that, we, that we've onboarded in November and it's spectacular but we're still working into it. But one of the keys of it is it's all digital. So we need everybody's email addresses. We, if you have resident parking and you don't get emails from us, like every once in a while, we're not spamming. This is like once a year, twice a year type of thing. You don't get an email from us saying, hey, it's time to renew or something like that. You call us up because we probably don't have your email. And we really could use emails. It's how we're getting hold of people. So to your point though, the whoops program, we recognize we haven't gotten the word out. We're actually working right now on fixing the website so that it's more clear when you get a ticket and you want to whoops it. The way to do it is go to the appeal portal, type in there, I'd like to whoops this ticket, and that's done. And I can whoops it for like the contractor came to my house. This is real, but he doesn't have, and he was just coming. Can so I whoops they, that ticket for him or no? They whoops it themselves. This is, whoops so it. this is what we're trying to do. trying to shift the responsibility okay. to the parker and not away from you. That's okay. sort of a concept. So the contractor now will learn, they whoops it, and in the process also learn, oh, I can buy an annual pass well, for $50 I told you about the pass, and get out of all this hassle, right? Okay. So this is why we're trying to push responsibility on the parker. To okay, make this choice. thank you. Uh, you got a question in there? Oh, so while you're on this whole thing, so are the blue chips no good anymore? They're no good. I have been saving them. Can you get this one? Oh, just one. You get one. Yes, right. you. Yeah. 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 But wait, let me tell you something about that electronic thing. My son-in-law lives on a residential parking street, and he's got the electronic thing. Well, he got a well, ticket. Right. Well, he has that electronic pass. He doesn't have the thing you hang in your car or a sticker. 
He set up with, he set up with the credit. He yeah. set up with the, the yeah. license credit. Okay, so here. Well, he got a ticket. And that, and that, it took hours and hours and hours to finally get that ticket removed. It was not easy, and he was legitimately paid for. It had not expired. Right. So, so the system. So here's it's not perfect yet. No, My oh, daughter oh, no. was going nuts because it, it she is. was the one that made call after call after call. So it is not perfect. I mentioned we tripled our workforce. We went from five to fourteen. We took people from the garages who used to be ambassadors who their job was to collect money and open and close the gates yeah. and we're training them on the street to Mistake, go around and get to go around and, and read license plates and get tickets mistakes are happening we just had an all hands meeting today and i put up a slide that said accuracy and consistency you have to be accurate you have to be consistent because so if you believe if you're in resident parking and you know you have a permit and we made a mistake just call us up and tell them, <laughs> and because that's an error, our error, and you have to fix it like that. You don't have to go through the appeal process. Don't not do not whoop something that you believe is actually a mistake. Right. We'll check if it's actually a mistake. Can we fix like that? If it's not, then it's it was something more a, complicated. A more a mistake within your system that yes. it took several hundred calls. I mean, they did correct it, your office, but it was not easy. And my daughter was sure. Yeah. So. Um, Jeff knows this. I sent you an email earlier to give you a heads up, but you already heard it from me before. Yes. Um, I understand the digital process, the internal improvement and efficiency, but what I think is lacking for me as a, as a person that lives on a, a residential parking only street is that when there was a permit, um, at least, you know, I live close to the hospital and the university. I could, if there wasn't a permit or a hanger, I would call and let you know that, you know, there was a problem. And, and sometimes these cars stayed for days and days and days. Um, now I have no way of knowing that because there's no, there's no visual. And so when I call, um, I may be wasting your time because, because and, so it, and there's not enough people to come around on a regular basis. Um, so I'm concerned. I like the internal for your efficiency, but I really like the visual because you expanded your enforcement by having all of our eyes helping you. Uh, well, we, yeah, so one of the concerns that we have is we don't like the philosophy the idea of the neighbors necessarily turn the neighbors in. Like we like the idea of, of us going out Control. If you call our office every day and say, I'd like you to drive down my street, we will do that. That will happen because that's what we're there for. And we but there are different shifts from the hospital. So you, you'd have to be like, you'd have to have a dedicated East Avenue. Um, <laughs> so put it this way a year and a half ago, we had five people total doing enforcement. One would be on vacation, one would be sick, then we'd have three. But we have three people that go from six, seven, nine five in the morning to 10 11 o'clock at night, a very low level of enforcement. Now we have shifts of five twice a day. So we have lots of folks out and available. Now we're not fully staffed, we're still have some challenges, but we're headed towards providing you the service you're expecting. Absolutely. We're, little, we're in a little bit of a growth from the same period. Yeah. So are those are those hangers not closed anymore? So we're so the, the guest pass, kind of the guest pass, yes. 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 Okay. So the guest passes, we're still handing out physical guest passes because we haven't fully developed the online guest pass. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that every time we guest pass, we have to get in there and put their their. That's why we haven't done yet. We know <laughs> we can do it, but we want when we do it, it has to be. Simple, simple. And well, it I promise it, it won't be simpler than handing them that thing and tell them to hang it in their yeah. pocket. Okay. You, got, yes. you said you're going to roll out some new software or features on the website? Yes. When is that going to happen? And can we get you to come back? It's ongoing, and I would like to come back. And like, um, Six months. And yeah. But before you leave, yes. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, first, Passion for parking. Thank you very much. <laughs> I um, what about really chronic ticket getters? Is there a restorative justice program that you're putting in place because there are people in prison because of unpaid chronic? So in Vermont, that doesn't really happen. That's not yeah, your uh, your driver's license is not tied to tickets. Ticketing is a wholly separate, and this is why I have to go to public to go to public works to do the parking enforcement at parks 
the parking enforcement of parks is actually a civil crime because it's wrapped into fireworks and fights and drinking and all these bad behaviors. So that's civil. We're ticked. We're a parking ticket. Yeah, yeah, it's legally yeah. a different thing. So yeah. they're not exposed. But this is part of why we did the scoff reform because we didn't want somebody to not be able to get to their job, get fired from their job, and then uh, commit a crime to get their car back. And, you know, we recognize it was part of that decay cycle and we want to stop it. So beyond whoops, is there some kind of restorative program in terms of not having there be a case of, I mean, I think, well, my understanding is that it, it's chronic um, fines that don't get paid. That's what I'm talking about, actually. It's not just a ticketing, but it's chronic fines that don't get paid. So is there some kind of restorative justice and looking at the issues for non payments and, and what's happening at that end in terms of um, No, at this point, right now, creating the whoops program was specifically created to encourage people to pay. We had people that owed over a thousand dollars to pay it off. Well, they paid off seven hundred and fifty-one dollars right. or whatever to get under the, the threshold. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's very complicated. We're and you know the passion for parking is. It and yeah. thank you for opening your mind. Yeah. 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 All yeah. right. Okay. Can I just throw one thing out there too? Um, because I've been waiting patiently to say my piece. Um, you talk about like uh, trying to have a single point of contact. Can I just bring to your attention that for those of us who drive electric vehicles. I'm paying the charger and I'm feeding the meter. Can we incorporate the meter into the charging fee? That, that, would, that would be lovely. I know, and we work with BDD. Uh, they, we have chargers in the garden. It's, it's very it's much more complicated than it seems like it should be. Yeah, I imagine. Yes, uh, we want to do it too. We're going to leave on BDD in the park. What? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. So I'm we're. we're... <laughs> You can see there's a lot of interest in this. I know. So <laughs> we were, we're going to look forward to having you here again, but we're, uh, I apologize, we're behind time, our schedule, and we invited some legislators and we want to move forward. Yes. Can I make a sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, go. Um, quick uh, request to consider a change in the uh, uh, the ordinance around uh, parking when you're unloading a vehicle. Uh, right now, it's restricted to trucks only, and I've had legitimate situations of unloading a passenger vehicle in that space, and I've been fined the seventy-five dollars uh, when trying to bring something to my office on Church Street. This is complicated on a lot of levels. Okay. Then mm -hmm. forget mm -hmm. it. Just two levels real quick. With one is I think Tom wants to move on. Yeah, I so, promise Tom. It was Jeff, I, 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 your car. I, I we do appreciate you coming. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. The last uh, thing on our agenda is a discussion by our state legislators, and I believe that we have. Do we have all four legislators yeah, here? I see Troy. I see. Brian, Our team. Oh, I see Tanya. And is Brian, Brian. Brian is not there. Brian's not there. So I guess we're going to start by um, having each of you make a statement as to, uh, I think, uh, what your priorities are, but also uh, what committees you've been assigned to and um, and perhaps what your committee is going to do. So with that, uh, Troy, you want to lead off? Sure. sure. Thanks. Thanks. Um, um, and okay. just, just let me put this out there first. If any of you find out that I have decided to maybe take up stand up comedy, remind me not to follow anyone from parking. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> um, for those of you who I have not met, my name is Troy Hedrick. I live on Billadu Court, which is one of those streets off of East Avenue. Um, and I have lived here for, gosh, coming up, uh, this will be 22 years, I think. Love my neighborhood, love my neighbors. Um, and am slowly, um, slowly getting my feet wet with this whole legislative deal that Selena talked me into. I don't know if Selena's watching tonight, but hey, thanks. No, it's it's a lot of fun. I've met some amazing people. Um, 
orientation um, was four days long. Uh, and <clears throat> almost immediately, I could feel the energy in the room. And there is just an amazing yeah, energy, just an amazing vibe. Um, at least in the house, I'll let Martine talk about the Senate. Um, a third of us are new. Um, there's a lot of passion. Um, there's a lot of great people. Um, there are so many great ideas floating around that room. Um, and I'm excited and optimistic. Um, and I'm not just saying that. Um, and I've been listening for a while. And some of my priorities are going to align with some of the conversation that was going on in the room. Um, I'm excited about that. I'm um, surprised right now at a common theme between um, corrections and UVM, and I'll say more about that as I get to both of those priorities. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, I have worked at UVM since 1996. I took a little break to run my own business. I started in residential life, so I have some thoughts on housing. Uh, I work in the Center for Student Conduct right now. Um, I have since 20, 2008. I meet with a lot of students, um, close to, oh, what's my, what are my stats? A thousand students a year. Um, students who, you know, who, who have made bad decisions and need a tap on the shoulder and guided in the right way. We take a very restorative approach to our work. Um, but I just, I really want to validate, at least anecdotally, um, what Sharon had said. Um, um, Upper class students do not want to live on campus. Upper class students um, are, 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 are just jonesing to get off campus. Um, the ones that do want to stay on campus tend to go to the lofts um, over on Redstone campus. Um, but I, yeah, I just really, really want to punctuate what Sharon said. I think she is spot on with that. Um, let me just jump in with my my legislative priorities, and then I, I think you're going to find out where they kind of click with some of the conversation that's been happening in the room tonight. Um, I'll start by talking about the first bill that I will be introducing. My guess is that it's going to hit the floor sometime next week. I'm currently gathering signatures to sign on. Um, and this has been kind of, uh, this is the first thought that came to my mind about if I could change something, what would it be? I am incredibly concerned about the national trend um, by which outside, private, very conservative groups are weaseling their way into school boards to change curriculum, to pull books from shelves. Uh, the best case example is Moms for Liberty. If you go to the web on NPR and check out All Things Considered from yesterday, you're going to hear an article that that um, you know, an interview that that talks about this. It's about an eight minute listen. Um, I am very worried. The Moms for Liberty um, is probably the best known group. Already has chapters in southern New Hampshire. They have chapters throughout Massachusetts. They have chapters throughout upstate New York. They are literally encircling us. And my bill intends, I'm going to talk about what it intends to do. Um, and probably more importantly, what it does not intend to do. Um, it's a short form bill, which means I haven't put a lot of detail in there. It's going to land in the education committee and um, they're going to have a lot of freedom to to create this. Um, they'll likely call me in to um, kind of provide my testimony about where I where I see this bill going. But I, I, I want to create a firewall. Um, I do not want to dictate curric curriculum. That is the work of the Board of Education and the supervisory unions. I do not intend to cur create curriculum. The only thing I want to do is um, prohibit the, those folks who do or prevent the folks who do create curriculum from prohibiting any teachers from talking about concepts of race, racial identity, gender, gender identity. Um, so when you think about, right, this is, so these groups, this is where the don't say gay laws come from. This is where the anti-critical race theory laws come from. Uh, you can think of this as go ahead and say gay, go ahead and talk about race, go ahead and talk about um, racial identity, go ahead and talk about structural and historic racism. That's what this bill intends to do. I'm going to encourage the committee to be very pinpointed with this. This is not a generic academic freedom law, right? Academic freedom in K through 12 is very, very different. It's not really a thing um, as compared to academic freedom in higher education. 
we essentially hire our teachers to teach the state curriculum. I just want to state that as we're doing that, creating that curriculum, you cannot prevent teachers from talking about race and gender. So that's the bill. Um, I'll keep you updated. I don't know whether or not it's going to have legs. I don't know how it's going to get picked apart. I'm working on partnerships um, across the Senate um, to be there when it shows up. Um, uh, oh, by the way, I, I've been assigned to the Corrections and Institutions um, Committee. Just came out of prior to this, and I know Martine was there too. Tanya, I don't know if you were there. I think maybe you were. I can't remember. Just came out of a briefing uh, on the status of incarcerated women. So um, I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. I want to get back to the UVM housing piece. This came up last night, and I spoke briefly to Jake after the Progressive Caucus last night. Um, and this is the first topic that landed on my front door or my email when I announced that, or you know, when I got elected into the position. So I was talking with Cindy Cook on East Avenue, Jonathan Chapel Sokol, um, who raised their concerns about the Trinity Project. Um, and I started scratching my head. And I know Cindy wants to take uh, an Act 250 um, route, and and maybe that that can potentially work. I don't think it will. Um, other people I've talked to are are hesitant to think that that might have any legs. Um, what I have th been thinking about, um, and I share Zariah's skepticism with regard to UVM's willingness to play along or play nice. Um, uh, full disclosure, I am an embittered st uh, staff member for the University of Vermont. We just went through a, a very long battle to get unionized. Um, and, and I do not feel things are good at UVM right now. And I don't think they're gonna play nice. And I do think it might be time legislatively um, to start talking about enrollment caps. I wanna do it very specifically, kind of two ways. I think it might be important to consider, can we cap UVM's enrollment until our rental vacancy reaches a 5% healthy limit? Um, that's gonna tap the brakes and it's gonna get them to the table to maybe problem solve collectively about um, how are we gonna build more housing so that we can get to a healthy rental vacancy so that we can bring more students onto campus. Um, the other thing I want to do um, kind of adjacent to that or in connection with that, probably in the same bill, is um, mandate that UVM has to guarantee a certain square footage for each on-campus student. Um, and that should probably be about half of what has historically been a double-sized room. Right now, UVM is just shoving students into triples. And again, I talk to a lot of students about behavioral stuff. A lot of that behavioral stuff is connected to the fact that there is no release valve right now for students who are jammed into very small spaces together. I think we need to get back into the practice of housing students in doubles, having a lot more singles available for students who have a, a, a medical need for singles, whether that's anxiety or other concerns. Um, so attaching a, an enrollment cap to a healthy rental vacancy rate, 5%, and mandating that students on campus are guaranteed a certain amount of square footage. That means even if they build a new house, a, a new residence hall, the first thing they're going to have to do is de-triple the overwhelming amount of triples on campus right now. Those hey, are my thoughts Joey, about you. We're going to, uh, um, I hate to cut you off, but... Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit and go to uh, Tanya, but we're going to circle back uh, for questions from the uh, the audience here. So Let me just say one more thing quick. Um, um, I was in a, I, I got Corrections 101 today uh, in my committee. We currently have, as of this morning, we have 107 women incarcerated. Fully 50% of them are being detained prior to sentencing. Hmm. So that's that's a problem. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Tanya, you're up. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Sorry I was late. My dog was uncooperative on her walk this evening, so it took longer than anticipated. Um, I have been assigned to the Committee on Judiciary in the Senate, and I am Vice Chair of Government Operations. Um, after going around with the committee members, the judiciary um, priorities that were identified were cannabis equity, 
um, discussing decriminalizing things that should really be in the mental health or substance use arena, prisons, um, prison reform, bail reform, and really looking at who's incarcerated, do they need to be incarcerated, um, police oversight, community safety, gun safety, um, tackling the court and civil, the court dockets and, and the backlog that's in, in the court and civil dockets, harm reduction, um, I think I already said bail reform, and sort of the connection between mental health and criminal justice. On government operations, we are talking about sheriff oversight, ranked choice voting, um, campaign finance reform, also police oversight. So my committees have some overlap, which is actually really lovely to be able to bring both viewpoints into the different committees. Um, I am working personally and have made it a priority around temp work, um, Vermont State Employee Temp Worker Misclassification um, and working towards some anti-privatization of state contracts. We will also be having conversations around legislative compensation and benefits. Um, there will be professional regulation conversations, but I don't think that is actually going to happen until next year, largely because we have a lot of reports coming back from the last biennium and the director of the Office of Professional Regulation is now the deputy secretary of state. And so we're doing a national search for a new director and need that person to be able to get up to speed before we can do OPR legislation. Um, we will also, of course, be tackling charters. Um, and I know Burlington has a just cause eviction charter that will be reintroduced probably ahead of um, town meeting day, but the rest of the charters will come in town meeting day. Um, personally, some of my priorities are looking at police oversight, municipal police oversight and sheriff oversight, looking at um life without parole, second look, cash bail, and really thinking about, you know, as we have the conversation about potentially building a big new prison, which I'm personally not in favor of, um, instead looking at who do we have incarcerated that could be supported in the community that might be better served by substance use treatment. Um, the, you know, Troy gave the statistics around the women's prison. Um, and while a large percentage of those people are there pre-trial, the vast majority of people are there due to substance use. And so rather than incarcerating these people, how do we make sure we have the community supports to provide so that they can tackle their substance use disorder? Um, I will be introducing a, a companion bill from the House around copays and epinephrine auto-injectors. Um, this is really personal to me as someone with severe allergies. Um, and I'm also looking at a, a really wonky technical bill around medical liens and the way the current medical industrial complex costs people money who have been in an accident, not allowing them to recoup their losses. Um, and then police oversight is another bill that I'm working on, as well as a cannabis equity bill, really looking at how we bring in um, equity and make sure everyone is represented in our new legal cannabis market. And there are some technical changes in there, but mostly that that is an equity bill. So the, those are some of of my priorities, having heard some of the testimony today, I also really want to look at universalizing our community justice centers and restorative justice responses across county. Chittenden County has a lot of opportunities, although there's still not enough, but there are counties in Vermont that don't have any community justice center and restorative justice opportunities. So I want to look at how we universalize that and make that much more equitable in how we access, we allow people to access restorative community justice. All right, thanks. Uh, Martine? Thank you. Um, happy to be here tonight. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is my first time Zooming from Montpelier. So give me a, like a thumbs down if I start um, losing my connection. Um, thank you. Uh, Representative Hedrick, I believe that your bill will come to Senate Ed at some point, and that's mm -hmm. where I am. I am, um, 
I'm vice chair of Senate education and I'm also on health and welfare in the morning. Um, so I'm excited to be in both of those. Uh, we literally today I had six hours, three in health and welfare in the morning and three hours in the afternoon in education with folks coming in from the agencies, from nonprofits, just schooling us on the ins and outs of everything health and welfare and education. So um, if I'm not quite as chipper as uh, Representative Hedrick and Vyofsky, it's because I, I don't know, I have a lot of learning today, a lot of learning. Um, so I'll just tell you briefly what my priorities are that I shared already in both of my committees. Um, in education, I started off with just a kind of a large umbrella around equity. Um, we didn't get into the weeds there, but as you know, there's a lot going on with um, taxpayer dollars going to private schools and so on. So that's something that we might be talking about at some point. Um, and also to um, to religious schools, uh, but we have to, you know, tread carefully in that arena because it is something that came down from the Supreme Court. Um, I spoke um, about, uh, by the way, when it comes to equity, I'm also talking about equity um, in terms of curriculum, um, as uh, Representative Hedrick brought up, making sure that Equity and inclusion is a huge part of what we're doing in Vermont. Um, it comes uh, it comes into play with financing, and that leads me to um, making sure that the student waiting bill that's already been started is properly rolled out. Um, I think many of you heard about the student waiting formula, but it's um, it's this one of the systems by which we allocate money um, to schools in our state. And we know, if you didn't know, there are three separate weights that are very important across the state. And those are for students living in poverty, EL students, and students living in rural communities. And those have been underfunded for years. So they've changed the formula so that it's more equitable and it's going to be rolled out in the next. Um, basically the next year. So we wanna make sure that that's done properly. Um, we found out a few um, years ago that our literacy rates here in Vermont are very low. So the um, legislature uh, passed some legislation around dealing with that issue and the AOE and the legislature put together this blueprint that is also um, being worked on. Um, that needs to get out into our schools and really hit the ground so that, um, you know, we're using all of this great uh, research to improve literacy scores. And I have to say today, we did get um, a whole bunch of test scores presented to us and they were, I have to say, quite disheartening. You know, we're in terms of proficiency in math, science, and reading, we're in sort of the 30% range. So a lot of work to do um, for sure in that regard. Um, school construction, I, something I've been talking about, I'm still talking about it. Um, it's something that we've been, you know, kicking down the road for decades and we have crumbling schools. We have schools that are poisoning our teachers, our students, our staff, um, and it, we need to address this. So it's something that I'm going to continue to talk about. It's a priority for me. Um, we lived it in Burlington and uh, it's very real for us, uh, but there are other schools that are also suffering because of just absolutely horrible um, infrastructure and, and buildings. So um, that's something that I put as a priority as well. Uh, in health and welfare, I basically um, tried to highlight some of the needs that were presented to us um, by both the mayor of Winooski and the mayor of Burlington. So I'll just read through a few. Um, specialized care for violent individuals, improved access to medication for opioid use disorder, contingency management for the growing meth use that we're seeing in our communities, uh, re-entry support for justice-involved individuals, 
uh, especially those with substance abuse disorder. Um, expand residential treatment opportunities, including long-term residential treatment, and remove barriers for um, overdose prevention sites. Um, I'm very, I feel very strongly about shield laws that protect uh, abortion providers um, who are working in other states. And I also talked a little bit about reducing or streamlining the prior approval process for uh, insurance. Um, so yeah, those are all my priorities and I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has any. All right, we're gonna go uh, first to Brian and then we'll uh, open the floor to questions. Can you just tell me how much time I have? So I wanna pace yeah, myself. Minutes. What's that? Five minutes. All right, because uh, I am working on a lot of things and I may not be able to say everything in five minutes, but I wanna try to at least give you a high level view. So let me set a timer or a stopwatch here. All right, go. I'll, I'll tell you, Brian. Yeah, you know what though? I like pacing myself because I really don't like when people interrupt me, but you can if you have to, but I'm going to try to pace myself. <laughs> um, so anyway, <clears throat> that was 10 seconds. Um, so, so as we, uh, as, as we're coming out of the, the crisis of the coronavirus pandemic, we're heading into additional crisis, ecological crisis, and we're seeing the collapse of the planet's ecosystems. And we have an opportunity here to spend an unprecedented level of federal money to build resiliency to the crisis that's ahead of us. We also, we can't just spend the money. We have to be thinking about how do we, we sustain the investments and, and work towards a steady state economy or more regenerative economy that doesn't destroy the earth um, and doesn't extract and exploit people. And so um, there's many ways I think we can do this. Um, one would be to continue, to be wise in the way that we spend that money over the next few years and try to invest in 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 the social determinants of health. The legislature already did a lot of good work in the last few years, and we need to learn from the mistakes and assess the strengths and build on the progress um, in terms of housing, food, uh, and economic development. So sp some specific bills I'm introducing that related to this would be um, a, a bill that would look at creating a year-round network of agricultural production in the state so that we can guarantee food to all Vermonters. Um, that's locally grown, uh, as well as banning pesticides and um, protecting people from PFAs in, in the food supply. Um, a regenerative economy act that would look at a process that changes our democracy to create regional planning assemblies or regional people's assemblies similar to neighborhood uh, planning assemblies where people will assess the strengths of regions and the challenges and look at how to engage in strategic um, redevelopment of the economy in regions so that we can uh, weather the storms ahead. Looking at universal a pathway towards universal health care by starting with universal primary care. Um, exploring the, uh, the possibility of a state bank or public banking system. Increasing the rights of tenants, for example, giving tenants the rights of first refusal on not only apartment buildings, but also single family homes. And looking at rent stabilization through tax policy, creating incentives for landlords to keep rent low and penalties if rent gets too high, but not telling landlords what they can or can't charge. Um, so it still allows property owners to have that freedom, um, but sort of tries to steer the behavior so that we can keep housing affordable for renters. Um, looking at a moratorium on new prisons as we explore a new way forward that reduces recidivism and promotes public safety. Um, we would do this by looking at uh, expanding housing um, in, in a way that guarantees housing that meets people's needs at every stage of recovery, including many varieties of transitional housing and supportive housing as people are leaving incarceration, but then reimagining incarceration as a form of secure residential treatment for those who are at risk of harming themselves or others or the environment with many pathways to less restrictive housing and integrating that with, with um, our existing treatment options and local resources so we don't separate people um, from the resources. We keep people, we, we may have to take people's freedom for some time, but we don't take away their dignity. We don't take away opportunity for them to learn and grow. Um, we don't punish people, but rather hold them accountable. Um, there's a lot of details to that bill I'd like to get, in, um, get into with you later, but I have a minute and 15 seconds left. Um, so I'm going to move on and just say that um, 
in addition to all of these investments that we can make with the money and policy changes, we need to be thinking about how to sustain them. And so I'm 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 talking with other members about ideas like a like a short term surcharge on the highest income earners, like Vermont did with Governor Snelling in the in the 90s. And using that to build up our state's reserves, build up the rainy day fund so that we have that in the future when there are times of bust as we're in a time of boom. And not only saving up the rainy day funds, but taking a percentage of it, maybe 10 or 20 percent and lending it to the people to buy the new homes that we're building, to buy apartment buildings and houses when they go up for sale, to invest in their small businesses, to invest in the in the economy we, we need to weather the storms ahead. So the idea being that as people pay back those loans, the money is going back into a fund that the state can use to then reinvest in the people of Vermont instead of having out of state banks. Um, making money off of the investments that we're building here. So, you know, through a combination of 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 strategic spending and and revenue, um, we can work towards an economy um, and a way of life on Earth that, that's better. Okay, that's five minutes and five seconds. I'll stop there. <laughs> oh wait, I had five more seconds. Okay, now I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, we have uh, questions. Yeah. Yes. So um, thank you all, <clears throat> oh my goodness. Um, Troy and Tanya and Brian have a question for you. And that is um, primary caretaker legislation. This has to do with the issue of uh, incarceration. And the question is, I've been told by people in New Hampshire that we have that on the boards here. Is it current legislation or do we have something in place? In other words, what it, what it suggests is that we really would have a program in place like we have all alluded to that really looks at community support alternatives, accountability, responsibility, and allows um, people who are primary caregivers um, to continue in that role as well. Are you aware of that legislation? Primary caretaker, no? I'm unaware of any legislation. I know that we have a program like like that Jess Kell does in the women's facility that allows um, parents like women who are incarcerated to to have contact with their children. But I I'm unaware of any. I'm aware new of that too, but, but that's nothing compared to this. I mean, it's it's a good thing that it's in place, but we got a long way to go. If that's all, I will do some more research on it. But I I really appreciate. Um, Can you send it? Send any articles or anything you yeah. find. My are any of our ways, but I, I'm more than happy to yeah to dig into that. Uh, especially, uh, it's, it's sounding like that would probably land in the corrections. Um, and I mean, my legislative email is active, and if you just go to troyhedrick.com, you're going to see a, a form there, um, or troyhedrickvt at gmail. I'd also love to see anything you pull up. I'm unaware of anything specific around that. I do know um, I just some of the statistics we heard today in judiciary, anything. So what I've learned is that the Senate committees of jurisdiction sometimes don't perfectly line up with the House committees of jurisdiction. So most of this would come through Senate judiciary. Um, so I'm certainly happy to take anything that you want to send my way. I'm not aware of any specific legislation, and I and I certainly heard today in some of our testimony, just background testimony, just the damage that is done. We've actually started working with um, New Hampshire about this, and they have um, a draft um, of this primary caretaker legislation. So, um, yes, I will send all three of you things. Thank you very much. That would be amazing. Thank you. I, I got a just a general question. Would we be well advised to, if we're going to send a, a targeted piece of information, to copy all the representatives from Burlington? Um, or is that just bogging down uh, people's in baskets? You can send me anything. I'll probably see it quicker at my Gmail account, probably. I, but send me it anywhere. Yeah. I try, so I I'm pretty obsessive about my inbox, so I, I, I try to stay on top of it. 
I definitely want to be in the know on what's going on for people that I'm representing. Um, so certainly send it to me. Um, you know, I may not always be able to super quickly have an answer because I don't know the answers to everything, but I can certainly try to find an answer. And and definitely if there are things coming up for my constituents, I want to know. So definitely include me. Um, and I think I, I know that the Burlington delegation in the house works pretty closely together, but I'll certainly let Brian, you know, speak to that. But I, I, and Troy, but please include me in anything that's coming up for you. I would say include me as well. And then um, Tanya and I can pass it on to Senator Baruth as well, if yeah. we feel that it's relevant for him to see. Thanks. The, que the question I heard was, should you send it to the entire delegation? I don't see any harm in doing that. Our email boxes are full already anyway. And, you know, we're sifting through hundreds of messages a day. I don't see it's not going to hurt to hear from more constituents and less from special interest groups or people spamming us. So I would say send it. And the worst case scenario is someone misses it. Um, don't ever hesitate to reach out. And I also would say if, if people reach out and you don't hear back and it's urgent, write again, because sometimes I triage every day. I go through and try to get back to the things that are like, time sensitive and then things get lost sometimes so just fe it's it's okay to send more than one email um until you hear back as a form oh, as a former community organizer like when i hear from all of you what's important to you it actually gives me more power in the building i'm one vote in in the senate but when i have the voices of all of you behind me it, it lends more credence to that so it actually gives me more ability to fight for what's important to you if i'm hearing from you well i don't see a lot of hands up but I, i've got another question if it's okay um and that's it's it's about well two questions actually one is about education and is there any chance or that we're going to get uh, legislation that will help communities build, rebuild schools, physical schools? As you know, Burlington is, is looking at a pretty big bond issue, <clears throat> but we're not the only people who are going to end up with um, contaminated schools that are going to end up being uh, torn down. And my understanding is that uh, the state has been... Um, unwilling or unable to contribute to this type of stuff since I think the Dean administration. So it goes back a long way that there's been sort of a moratorium on on uh, supporting school districts and rebuilding. Is is, is I mean, that I'm, anywhere and, and is there anything we can do to help push that? Yeah, I, I will gonna, say that. Oh, go sorry. Ahead, Brian. Yeah, just I introduced a, a bill like in my first year on this issue and got shot down hard. I could even send you the testimony where they're, they're like making fun of me for in committee for actually asking and and like kind of talking about the history of why. And I would say that we have to do something now. There's too many schools like crumbling. And instead of having a moratorium on building new schools, we should have a moratorium on building new prisons and we should be building schools and, and the infrastructure that keeps people out of prisons. So I, I'm willing to go back and fight further on this issue. But um, yeah, but, Martine, I, I'm going to answer in the affirmative. Yes, I think there is a chance. I think um, there's a good chance. Um, there are folks who are speaking with our new treasurer about this. Um, there are, for example, the head of the VSA, um, Jeff Francis, is extremely passionate about this. Superintendents are on board. Um, it's an equity issue. Um, I would tie it in with workforce development. Um, folks are not going to want to move to Vermont if our schools are literally poisoning our children. Um, this is something that has to happen. Um, it's well past time. And I feel as if there is a groundswell of support now. Um, to do something. And, you know, I'm sure that this isn't going to be the kind of aid that will pay for an entirely new building, but it will pay for part of a new building. It should, you know, I keep telling the legislature, you got to throw taxpayers a bone. You've got to help us out. This is a huge burden for us. And it not only shows goodwill on the part of the legislator and our leaders, but it helps us be able to do this work. Um, there's a good chance that not all schools will need to be rebuilt. They may not all have the PCB contamination that we had in Burlington, but they will need 
some kind of renovation. And then there will be those that will need to be entirely rebuilt. But yeah, I feel positive that this is going to happen. Um, and I think Joel and Sam have their hand up. Let me let me jump in. I think the energy is best um, to originate in the Senate on that one. Um, and I'm glad to hear that it's there, Martine. Um, this came up very briefly today because this is going to come out of the Capitol bill, uh, which is um, corrections and institutions. Um, and I did not hear a lot of enthusiasm or optimism from the chair. Um, and I, I can do what I can, um, but if it comes from the Senate with gusto, I think that's probably the best bet. We got a hand up. Um, Joel and Sam. Sam? Hey, everyone, thanks. Uh, my question is related to transportation and transportation equity, I suppose. And it's nothing that's been explicitly uh, talked about in the meeting tonight. Um, but one of my observations here in Vermont is like how difficult it is to be mobile if you're poor or not even if your car is not in good shape. Um, we take the bus around here when we can, but we like to we prefer to ride our bicycles. It's more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And cars are just a um, really difficult thing to have here unless you unless you have the time and the money to really dedicate to a car. Um, so, you know, uh, what we've been doing over the past two years since the pandemic really is just pouring over old transportation maps of streetcar routes and formerly free or nearly free transportation options, um, which benefited poor people, old people, kids, differently abled um, bodies of all types. And something that I've just um, uh, so, something that like particularly kind of piqued my interest was seeing that Vermont or maybe Chittenden County, I can't remember exactly which department was pushing this promotion to encourage people to purchase electric vehicles or e-bikes or all sorts of things and then get a tax credit um, for that. But I don't really see this as solving like um, environmental issues. We're still creating more materials, these batteries are terribly harmful for the environment. Um, it's just encouraging poor people or less fortunate people to contribute to a system, which is already quite oppressive by how much money is just forced to maintain a vehicle. And so one of my big things um, that, that I'm curious about is if there's any movement or if anyone has any ideas or passion about uh, better public transportation the way the way things used to be which I know there's no such thing as going back but it's famously touted that we used to be able to take public streetcars from state to state and city to city and just hop on and hop off uh, in certain neighborhoods so I'm wondering if anyone on the call has any um... and I kind of just want to add to that and just say if there's any incentives of like not having a electric vehicle or electric bike and either have, being a household with no car or being a household that primarily uses either public transportation or walking or biking because that's uh i mean if we had our our way we would just get a shuttle to go to any ski areas or go to any of the places that we want to go hiking but unfortunately we have to have a car to go do those things um so yeah the kind of yeah, if there's incentives for those. Wow. <laughs> I mean, the short answer to your question is no, those incentives do not exist. Um, I will certainly say that this resonates so much with me as someone who grew up in a working class single parent home and who came back here struggling to afford all of the things I had to afford and recognizing that in the state of Vermont, if you truly want to be able to do all the things, you just have to own a car. And it, so it's, it's, I'm really committed to creating a, I also, I went to college in Boston where it's not the best public transportation system and you probably don't want to look at it right now, mm -hmm. um, but they have public transportation. Um, I'm really invested in looking at the ways that we grow our public transportation system. We have some micro transit pilots in multiple um, municipalities, Montpelier was the first one, which is sort of like public Uber. So you've got an app on your phone, instead of a fixed route, you've got an app on your phone and that public transit comes to you um, and, and works in that way. And it's worked really well in Montpelier. Um, there is an application process for municipalities to sign up to be the next 
pilot. Um, and so I would really, and, and I have that whole process because I've been working to try to get Essex to do it because I think Essex is really prime for, for that method. Um, and some communities have done sort of hybrid fixed route and this micro transit system. There's also a lot of um, conversation around rail. Um, it is almost every Vermonter lives within a half mile of a rail line. And so really thinking about how do we build out our rail system? You know, I, I work as a social worker. I have to do like home visits and all kinds of like ad hoc stuff. Like I literally can't do my job without a car, but that doesn't have to be that way. And it isn't that way everywhere. And having been to Europe where they have invested in incredible public transportation and high-speed rail, and you don't see cars on the road because why would you drive if you can just hop on the train? And so I, I think there's also a lot of, of push we need to do with, with the federal delegation to make the investments in things like high-speed rail so that we can actually make connections, not just within the state of Vermont, but across the country. Um, you know, when, when I was in Germany, I could get on a train and in two hours be in France, whereas here, if I'm in Vermont, I can get on a flight and be in DC in 50 minutes, but it's going to take me 10 and a half hours to get there by rail. And so I, I think there's a lot of conversation that we need to have at the local level about making our public transportation free in perpetuity. It is right now, but we need to make sure that it stays that way, that anyone who needs to access public transportation can simply access public transportation as well as more reliable more and more accessible and more widespread because there's plenty of communities in the state of Vermont that in Burlington, there's probably our most reliable and connected public transportation system. I'm in Essex. It would take me an hour to get to Burlington and three bus transfers. And so why would I do that? And so we need to really build out a more cohesive and equitable system of public transportation in the state. But we also need to be advocating with our federal delegation to be making the infrastructure investments in building out transportation. I'm not on the transportation committee, um, but this is so like as, as someone who's struggled with how do I do my job when I can't afford a car, when I can't afford yeah. insurance, when, when I, I, I'm there, I hear it. And it, and, and I have advocated for some changes to our T bill, which is our capital bill that manages everything transportation to be more accessible mm -hmm. to renters as, as the only renter in the Senate to be more accessible to people who a lot tax credits aren't going to be helpful for because I just don't have the upfront money to put in. So you give me a tax credit that doesn't help me because because I'm not in an income bracket where that actually is is beneficial where I can even access that benefit. So I'm always happy to hear these things and and advocate with our with our transportation committees. Um, but the short answer to all of your questions is no. <laughs> I just want to I want to jump in and encourage. I was I, really I, just. I would like to just say something. Uh, Green Mountain Transit has, uh, through a consultant, presented <laughs> to the transportation committees. I think in the House and maybe in the Senate as well, uh, alternatives for funding public transportation because the current funding formulas that we use really don't work. And um, it's it depends on whether you're urban or rural, how how you have to go after funds from communities that you serve. And in some cases, you have to go out and, and get a petition signed before the select board will approve an increase. Um, and that's not working. Uh, we're, we're, we've really, Green Mountain Transit has cut its workforce back and it's on the verge of cutting services because it just doesn't have enough money to operate. So at the last session, I believe there was a, a number of proposals, uh, sort of a wide um, uh, um, uh, proposals to uh, collect uh, money, say from uh, electric utilities, all right? A small amount each month from uh, each account uh, to help pay for uh, public transportation. Specifically, that that pitch was given to per, to sustain Green Mountain Transit's uh, fare free policy, but um, it hasn't gone anywhere. And as of this week, we've proposed that uh, GMT is going to reimpose fares in July. 
So um, if there's no movement, that's going to happen. Move it. <laughs> we need your help. I need your help. <laughs> yeah, I'm here to help, but we, but, but I want to work in partnership. I mean, we need all of you to be telling our transportation committee that, and I'm on the inside fighting for this, but we're going to. I, I want to work together. Yes, I agree. Do we have other questions here? Or do people want to make comments? Awesome, quick one, maybe. Okay. Uh, hey, folks. Um, Earhart here. Uh, so I understand that the Clean Heat Standard Bill that got vetoed by the governor is coming back in new form. Um, not has been a lot of comment on uh, climate change and environmental justice issues. So I just uh, kind of wanted to see where you four are uh, are going to be at on that bill. The affordable heat standard, correct? Yeah. Affordable heating yeah. act. Uh -huh. Affordable heating act. Yeah, that's the new name for it. Um, I I am a co-sponsor on the bill. Um, Tanya, I believe you are the Senate bill, right? No. Um, so yeah, I'm. I'm all for it. I know that there's some pushback around. Um, uh some of the some of the you know intricacies in the bill um but uh i i'm supporting um senator bray and um i i'm i'm supporting the bill at this time sorry i'm i'm tired i'm losing my words <laughs> so people may or may not know that initially i voted no on the clean heat standard but i did vote to override the governor's veto the reason that i voted no on the clean heat standard was my concern around biofuels and the lack of clarity around how we were going to protect our low and moderate income vermonters from hikes in in rates um in my view the affordable heat stand heating act took the criticism of the clean heat standard and did a reasonable job at addressing many of those issues. Biofuels are still included in the bill. I never anticipated that they wouldn't be. However, they are capped and that cap decreases over time. So it over time, it makes biofuels less and less of, of a reasonable option. Um, it also has provisions to prevent clear cutting to grow biofuels, as well as provisions to incentivize food growth over biofuel growth. It's not perfect, but it is much better than, than what was in the clean heat standard. I want to see what the committee deliberation process looks like around some of the provisions for protection of our lowest income and moderate income Vermonters. Right now, it's a lot of incentives for heat pumps and incentives, which again, as I pointed out earlier, if you're really low income tax incentives aren't actually helpful because you don't have the upfront cost. So I'm hoping that during the deliberation process, they will fine tune what that looks like. But my initial read on the Affordable Heating Act is that it is a better bill than the clean heat standard. It is not perfect. Um, and there is, is definitely room for improvement. And, and it would be helpful to hear from community organizers and, and folks that are really in the most impacted groups as to how we can make that a stronger bill. If that bill were to come to the floor today, I would probably support it. Um, again, it's not perfect, um, and there is definitely room for improvement. But I, I also trust the Senate committee process that they're that they're really hearing that feedback. Um, you know, they literally took all of the criticism of the clean heat standard and tried to address it in some way. There's no world in which today we eliminate biofuels. However, I appreciated the the graduated step down away from biofuels and the protection for our old growth forests and our crop growing lands. Um, so I recognize that is a really complex answer to what should have, have been a simple question. Um, but I sit in the space right now of generally being supportive of the changes that have been made and more supportive of this bill than I was the previous bill and hoping that through advocacy and testimony, it becomes an even stronger bill through the committee process. 
Ryan, can you speak to, do you know where that is coming back from the house? No, but I'm just going to say, yes, I'll support it. It, yeah, nothing same. it was perfect. I could just say that. You know, guys, I think we're, we're, we're running out of time <laughs> and we're losing our audience. <laughs> so, um, I want to thank, oh, I want to thank you all. We really, we really do appreciate it. And, um, and hopefully you will we'll, we'll hear more from you as the session goes on. So thanks a lot for your time. And um, would you would you be open to meeting with us again in a couple months? I'm certainly open to, to plugging it. I can't be at every meeting all the time always. So like, yes, I'm open to connecting with you, but it will depend on kind of where we're at and what the Senate schedule looks like. Um, I also know that um, Senator Glick and I will be organizing monthly coffee chats where people can come to us with their issues. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll keep you posted on the details. We're going to try to do them in each community as well as some Zoom opportunities so that instead of having to go to multiple different MPAs and select board meetings, y'all can come to us yes. in a space That's we're holding. Fair. That sounds fair. However, Troy and I can come, I think. So please don't wait for the Senate to reach out to us. We're happy to come as much as possible. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, yeah. It's okay. an easy, easy, it's typically easy for me. Um, you know, there might be the occasional evening where I'm still down in Montpelier, but always happy to be there. Well, typically in person, it was just a long- Montpelier long. today, right? I'm in I'm Montpelier. Not. I'm in the hotel right now. So I, I'm on Billadoo. <laughs> okay. I'm in Ward One right now. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you thank very much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much.